I want to go back to the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. That term has been uh, used a few times over the last three days. Do you think the Supreme Court is legitimate? I do, Senator. And so some of the ways that the court has been derided and called illegitimate by members of this Senate include, over the course of recent days and weeks, quote, leans into extreme partisanship, uh, leans into extremism, twists the law, threatens basic liberties, has been hijacked by Republicans. These kinds of attacks undermine the public's trust in the court. We need the public uh, to believe in the legitimacy of its government, including all three branches. So I would ask you, um, do you agree with these characterizations of the court that have been levied in this room over the last few days? Senator, I have nothing but respect for um, my former judicial colleagues, my current judicial colleagues, and uh, hopefully my future judicial colleagues. Uh, I do believe that we need legitimacy. Um, I've said that that's uh, the currency of the court, and I look forward, uh, if I'm confirmed, to, to joining the institution. So do you think there could be any opinion that would be handed down this term that could undermine the legitimacy of the court? Senator, I think the Supreme Court um, makes its determinations, and um, all of them are precedents, and they are entitled to respect. Um, I'd like to come back to our conversation from yesterday. You pointed out a number of times that as both a district and now a circuit court judge, you were constrained and bound by the Supreme Court's holdings. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times that you haven't had a chance to do uh, much constitutional interpretation for yourself. I largely agree uh, with the way you framed most of that for the lower courts, but I think you would also agree with me that the job of a Supreme Court justice is different uh, than a district court judge and in certain ways from a circuit judge as well. Um, when you serve on the Supreme Court, you'll have to interpret what the Constitution means. And based on what you told us about the constrained role on the lower courts, uh, lower court decisions would then not be able to answer how you would approach the new job you would have on that highest court. And so that's why I thought our conversation on uh, judicial philosophy yesterday was somewhat um, helpful. I'm not a lawyer, but I think you took a lot of us to law school yesterday in ways that were helpful. And in particular, um, you walk at, walked us through some different schools of constitutional and statutory interpretation in ways that I think were good for the committee, were good for the court, and were good for the public more broadly. So I guess I would ask you, um, if you could take us to law school uh, one more time and walk us through some of the different approaches to substantive due process and unenumerated rights, what are the different ideas on the Supreme Court and in the broader legal community? Thank you, Senator. I am um, <clears throat> not uh, mostly familiar with the Supreme Court's precedents in this area. Um, it's been a while now that the Supreme Court has determined that um, the 14th Amendment, which um, guarantees due process, includes a substantive component in addition to procedure. The term due process, one would think, is just uh, about the procedures that the government has to afford you before it um, uh, affects your life, liberty, or property. But the Supreme Court has also said that um, that, that protection extends to certain uh, personal individual rights um, that relate to dignity and autonomy um, and uh, that are deeply rooted in our nation's history and traditions or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And the kinds of things uh, the court has recognized pursuant to that um, uh, line of jurisprudence are things like um, marriage, um, interracial marriage, uh, the access to contraception, um, uh, a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy, abortion, um, pursuant to or subject to the, the framework established in um, Roe and Casey, um, travel, their, oh, uh, the ch child rearing, um, the ability to uh, direct your, your children. Uh, those are 
some of the rights that have been uh, recognized pursuant to the 14th uh, Amendment due, cl due process clause. I'm less mm -hmm. familiar with the sort of scholarly debate outside of uh, the Supreme Court's rulings. So will there be new ones in the future? Um, Senator, I am not able to forecast. In every case, the Supreme Court is um, looking at a particular set of circumstances consistent with the Article Three requirement that the court look only at cases and controversies. So it would depend on what cases came before the court. So I think, I think that gets at the, the challenge here that you and I have been going back and forth on over the course of a couple of weeks because um, I get the modesty points about being on the district court, but it seems pretty important to understand what the limits might be um, as a justice. And so I think this morning, again, you stated that your, I think the quote was that your judicial philosophy is your methodology, but I think that a judicial philosophy of some kind is necessarily an input uh, into your judicial methodology and into every justice's actual jurisprudence on the court. And that's why I think it's important for us to unpack that because the philosophies that you've outlined for the committee, again, I think yesterday's uh, back and forth that you and I had on uh, Breyer v. Scalia, um, is important. And you wouldn't claim any of those philosophies for yourself and yet I think the philosophies ultimately instruct judges on the sources and the tools they consult, on how they discern intent, on whether the Constitution is protecting specific limited and defined principles or more general values and whether modern values can be used to infuse our understanding of the Constitution. So um, again, when you narrated a bit of the debate between Justice Breyer, I know you've got lots of uh, intellectual inputs in life, but you've credited him as a, as a brilliant jurist and role model before. And the Scalia debates, you, you didn't really tell us who you thought got the better of the argument. And so I think throughout these two days, you've focused a lot on what the Supreme Court has said. And I think that is helpful and important. Um, but I've been also trying to get at what you think the limits might be on what um, Justice Jackson would be constrained by. So I, I, I feel like, I believe we still haven't heard your judicial philosophy, um, and I, I wish I'd made more progress with you on that. Um, but what we do know on a personal note um, is that these committee uh, three days have been very long, and I want to thank you and got to have a nice conversation with your parents earlier, your whole family, uh, for what you've uh, endured and uh, for spending time with us and uh, obviously wish best wishes to you and your family. Thank you, Judge. Thank you.